And today, we're going to take a look at the dream begins. <clears throat> the dream begins. How many of you have ever had a really good dream? Oh, yes. Yeah. I've, there, I've had some good dreams I didn't want to wake up from. I remember as a kid, I'd wake up from a good dream and I'd think, oh, i got to go back to sleep. i got to get this dream going again. And then there have been other dreams. Uh, I remember <coughs> I've had some real doozies. I, I remember one, one night I was dreaming. I was in my, my, my truck, and Stephen was still little then. And he and his buddy were in the, We had an extended cab, and they were in the back, and they were playing some kind of game on the seat. And I was driving, and all of a sudden I realized I was on a high bridge that made a Y, and I missed the Y, and I went off. And I was falling. You ever, you ever dreamt you were falling? Yeah. I'm in my truck and I'm falling. And I remember looking back over the seat, seeing the two boys. And somehow we were falling perfectly straight. It was a wonderful thing. <laughs> but I looked back and saw the two boys there playing, and I thought, well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anything because it'll just no use in them being afraid before they hit. And so I just decided as as I was dropping out of the sky in the truck that <clears throat> I was gonna keep quiet. And the next thing I knew, I woke up screaming. <laughs> so, uh, so, and, and after that, Stephen, you know the bridge in West Virginia where, we, where it wise like that? It's such a deep. I, had to, I wasn't driving. <laughs> but I, I love heights, but for some reason, for the next couple times we went over that bridge in Charleston, I had to close my eyes and not look because it just gave me the heebie jeebies. That's why we were swaying. No, I wasn't driving. So. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we have these dreams, good and the bad. Sometimes they're, they're silly dreams. Sometimes they're profound. But God has a dream for us. And we're going to take a look at the dream. And I want to begin today uh, setting all this up by looking at the story of Jacob. How many, how many know, who knows what the, the name Jacob means? The, the deceiver and the heel grasper. He, he, he had a hold of the, he was the heel grasper. He was the deceiver. He was the one that, that, that let other people do the work and he just came along and enjoyed the ride sometimes. And so we have the story of Jacob and Esau, Rachel, Leah, and Laban. And I just want to set this up before we get into the scripture we're going to so you know where we've, we've been to get there. In the story of Jacob, Jacob and Esau were twins. And when they were born, the, the first one came out, which was Esau, the older brother. And how many of you know in, in the Bible times, the older was the one that was, he was the, 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 main, the main one. And Esau came out, and as they were pulling him out, there was a little hand grasped around his, his ankle. And then out came Jacob. And the, the, the Lord spoke in this instant and said, the, young, the older will serve the younger. How many of you know when God speaks something, it's going to happen? Amen. Amen. And he spoke this truth. But how many of you know sometimes we try to help God? <laughs> and one day, as the two boys had grown up, Esau was a woodsman. He was an outdoorsman. He was a rough, rugged guy. He was, front, remember Frontier Fremont? I'm the only one. Grizzly Adams? Oh, yeah. Fremont, okay. Same guy, just two different stories. All right. Uh, but uh, uh, he was a Grizzly Adams. He, he liked the outdoors. Jacob, however, he was more of an indoor guy. He, uh, he, he just he wasn't into all that outdoorsman stuff. And one day Esau was out hunting. How many of you know, sometimes when you go hunting, you just hunt, you don't find. And he had been hunting and hunting to the point that he was famished. And as he was coming in from the field, his brother Jacob, he was a chef. And he, was, he was cooking up some bean soup. And Esau said, oh, that smells good. Give me some of that soup. I'm starving. And Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. <coughs> What you're going to get from that? Sell me your birthright. And Esau, being the intelligent man he was, said, "What good is it going to do me if I die of hunger?" Now, if you're out hunting, you, you, you could be out hunting for two weeks, and still you're not going to die of hunger. 
I imagine he was just out for a day, maybe two. But he thought he was going to die of hunger. He said, what good is my birthright if I die of hunger? Have my birthright. And he sold his birthright for a bowl of beans. Hmm. A little bit later, if we know the story, Daddy is getting ready to, he's getting to that point where he knows he's going to die. And, and he's, he calls, he wants his, his son Esau to come in so that he can pronounce a blessing on him, and he calls him in, and Esau comes, and, and his, his daddy looks at him, because Esau was daddy's favorite, Jacob was mama's favorite, how many of you know favorites aren't a good thing, and Esau came in, and daddy, he was, he was old, his, his eyes, he, he, he couldn't see, and, and he got confused easily, and he said, I, I, want to, I want to give you my blessing, my son, he said, before I do, I want you to go out and, and get some of that wild game that you you get, and I want you to prepare it, and I want you to bring it into me. I love that. It's making my lips water right now talking about it. I want you to come in and bring that to me, and then after I eat, I'm going to pronounce a blessing on you. And Mommy was sitting in the background listening. She ran out, and she grabbed Jacob, and she said, Quick, get, bring in some of that meat. Go, go, go get that, slaughter that. And we'll bring it in. I'm going to cook it up real quick. You're going to pretend to be your brother. He said, oh, I can't get away with that. First of all, he smells. <laughs> she said, that's okay. I've got one of his jackets. We'll put his jacket on you, and then you'll smell just as bad as he does. She said, well, what? But, well, and he's all hairy, and I'm not. And she said, well, that's okay. I'll, and, and they went and got wool and put it. I don't know how they did it. Exactly, but they put a, some wool stuff on his arms and on the back of his neck. She fixed the food. He went in, and Daddy knows something's up. He says, are you really my son Esau? And the heel grabber says, well, yes, I am. And he goes in, and, and Daddy <clears throat> says, come here. Are you really my son? Yeah. Let me, let me feel you. And he, oh, you are hairy. And you smell like it. you must be Esau. And Daddy performed, gave that blessing to Jacob. And I, you know, about then, in every story that happens, Esau comes walking in. Here I am, Daddy. I'm ready for my blessing. And he said, who are you? Oh, he's probably thinking, oh, Dad's lost it before I got my blessing. Oh, no, no, Dad, I'm Esau. I'm your son. He said, well, then, who was it that came in here and I blessed already? Heel grabber. He said, well, bless me anyways. He said, I can't. I only had one blessing and I gave it away. Sorry, son. And Esau was mad and Jacob, mommy said, Jacob, bud, you better run. Run to Uncle Laban's house. He'll take care of you. And how many of you know the easiest person to con is another con? And she sent her con son to her con brother and he got there and when he gets there he meets he meets a beautiful young lady named Rachel, Laban's daughter. And he goes to work for Laban, and he makes a deal with Laban, I will work for seven years. And at the end of seven years, that's going to be what I, what I pay for your daughter. I want to marry Rachel. And Laban said, that'll be fine. They put it together at the end of seven years. Boy, they put a party together. They, and uh, Jacob partied probably a little bit too much. And then it was dark, and... He went in for the honeymoon and woke up the next morning and it wasn't Rachel, it was her sister Leah <coughs> laying there next to him. Uncle Laban had conned him. And he went back to him and, and what, what's this about? What have you done? And he said, oh, I couldn't marry off my younger daughter before my older daughter. He said, uh, so they struck a deal seven more years he had to work. And as we, <coughs> we look at this story, Jacob is married to, to Leah and to Rachel. And in Genesis chapter 29, verse 31, it says, Now the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, and he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. And as we look at this story, and we see Rachel, she wants to have children. Those that, that 
have desired to have children. I've got some, some family members that wanted children so desperately, but they just weren't able to conceive. And, and the hurt that, that comes with that. And, and Rachel was experiencing that. And Leah, God had blessed, and she started having children. And, and Rachel was concerned about that. So Rachel grabs her servant, uh, Billa, get that name right, her, grabbed her servant, Billa, brings her to Abraham, or not Abraham, to Jacob, and says, I want you to have a child with her so it will be like me having a child. So he has a relationship with her. She has children. Then Leah doesn't think she can have any more children, so she brings Zilpha to Jacob and says, I want you to have more children with my servant. So they do that. And in Genesis chapter 30, verse 14, it says, Now in the days of harvest, of wheat harvest, Reuben went and found mandrakes in the field and brought them to his mother Leah. Her son Reuben, out in the field, he finds these mandrakes, he brings them to his mother Leah. Then Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But she said to her, is it a small matter that you take my husband? And would you take my son's mandrakes also? Get a little testy, can you tell? So Rachel said, Therefore, he may lie with you tonight in return for your son's mandrakes. Verse 16. When Jacob came in from the field in the evening, then Leah went out to meet him and said, You must come in to me, for I have surely hired you with my son's mandrakes. So he lay with her that night. You think your family's got problems. <laughs> yeah, dysfunctional. Yeah. You think, you, you think your family has, has got problems there, has got issues. Let's go to verse 22. Then God remembered Rachel, and God gave heed to her and opened her womb. So she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my reproach. And she named him Joseph, saying, May the Lord give me another son. Isn't it amazing that these became the 12 tribes of Israel? In a situation like that, I mean, this is, as I read this, I've read it before and thought this, that this time, for some reason, really jumped out at me and thought, this family is really whacked. <laughs> they, are, they are a mess. And, and I, I begin asking God, Lord, how could you build the nation of promise on something like this, as I was, as we were talking about this and praying over it this morning in, in the prayer time, I looked at the people and I said, you know what? If we had a family like this in the church, I would probably pull them off to the side and say, you need to find another church. <laughs> we don't need the drama. <laughs> we don't need the craziness. You know, you got, you got uh, Jacob. He's, he's stolen everything. Then he marries his cousin. And that was a con because it was the wrong cousin and he marries another cousin. And, and then these two sisters, can you imagine, could you imagine going to church with these two sisters sitting one on one side, one on the other side of the congregation, dark knives at each other, and, getting a, and, and trying to get their, their team against the other team? You know, that's how we do it in church. We don't fight, we just divide. <laughs> All this is going on. I, I, was, I, I told the group, I said, I, if, if, we had, if we had a family like this in church, I think I'd sit them down and say, you need to find another place to go to church because this just ain't, ain't working. Yet, yeah, I said, God, how could you use something like this? And the Lord began speaking to my heart. He would rather me fall forward and fail forward than to fall backward and fail I begin to ask him, what, do, what do you mean? What does that mean? And I was reminded of when we, when we started Water's Edge Assembly of God. We were two churches, Cherry Valley Family Life and First Trinity. And when, we, when things came together and God began opening doors, we began to pray. And I had someone come to me and say, what do you think about us merging the churches together? And I said, well... If it isn't God's will and we do it, we're in trouble. But I said, if it is God's will and we don't do it, 
we're in trouble. And I believe God would rather me fail reaching out, trying to do what he wants, trying to find what he wants, instead of sitting back. The Bible says, I would rather you be hot or cold than lukewarm, just holding in the middle. And this morning, I believe as we look at what it is to have a dream and to live the dream that God has for you, it's going to take some faith to step out of the boat. Amen? Amen. That's what we're looking at this morning. God wants us to stay, to step out in faith. But let's, let's back up now. We, and the title of the message is, And the Dream Begin. Let's go back to where the dream begins. If you look with me in Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. It says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram. He's still Abram. He hasn't been turned into Abraham yet. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram, he was childless. He was trying to, to follow God. He was doing his best to do what God spoke to his heart. And things just weren't happening. You ever been there? God, I'm, I'm trying to do you, I'm doing what you want, and, and the things that I believe you want to do in my life aren't happening. As a matter of fact, bad. You ever had a day where Tish, Tish looked at me this morning and said, don't hand me anything, I'm dropping everything I put in my hand. I mean, she was just having trouble after trouble this morning, and we need to, there are times when the difficulties come, and we, we get to that point where we think, Lord, are you really going to bless but God said, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Now, as I looked at this, I was looking at, I went through some commentaries. I found some interesting things. Adam Clark here writes down how God reveals his plan. I put it, how God reveals the dream in his word. He writes, as God reveals his will, not only to patriarchs, but also to prophets, evangelists, and apostles, it seems to have done, been done in different ways. First, God did it by a personal appearance of him who was afterwards incarnate for the salvation of mankind. First, God, a lot of ways, God used Jesus Christ to speak his words. Second, by an audible voice, sometimes accompanied with emblematical appearances is what he said. Third, by visions which took place either in the night, in ordinary sleep, or when the persons were cast into a temporary trance by daylight, or went about their or went about their ordinary business. Another way that God revealed his vision, his dream for their lives, was by the ministry of angels who appeared in human bodies and performed certain miracles to accredit their mission. So he, he used his son, he used an audible voice, he, brought, he let them see visions in their sleep or in, in a trance type state, and he used angels and then he allowed them to perform miracles. Remember when the angel of the Lord went to, to Gideon and Gideon brought the sacrifice, the angel of the Lord caused the fire to come from the rock? Those, God allowed the angels to perform those miracles to, to add credit to who they were. But fifth, and most commonly in the New Testament, in the New Testament church, by the powerful agency of the Spirit of God upon the mind, giving it a strong conception and supernatural persuasion of the truth of the things perceived by their understanding. So the, 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 the way God typically does in the New Testament church is the, the Holy Spirit comes in, and the scripture tells us what? Don't you know that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit if you have Jesus Christ as your Savior? And the Spirit of God brings utterance and works in our lives. And so we need to understand as we're looking, as we're beginning this dream, and as Abram was beginning that dream that God was pouring into his life, he listened to the voice of the Lord. And we've got to listen to the voice of the Lord, the Holy Spirit speaking into our hearts. And into our lives. And some people might say, I've never heard that voice. Listen to me. God is always speaking. 
speak to you. We've got to listen. And it's not a loud voice, but what they taught their children back in, in the Old Testament days, it wasn't, it wasn't the, the wind that broke the rock. It wasn't the fire that burned off the hillside. It wasn't the earthquake that shook the ground. But it was the still, small voice. And we've got to listen for that still, small voice. As we continue on in Genesis 15, verse 2 says, Abraham said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I am childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born of my house is my heir. And as you look, he's, he's reasoning with God. And he says, Look, I don't have any children. So even if you do bless me, I don't have anything to do with this, but I guess. I do have one that was born in my house, my servant's son. I like my servant. Son seems like a good boy. I'll make him, I'll make him the one that receives. Verse 4, then behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. You've got to understand, as we mentioned before, he was at an age. And his wife was at an age, it was looking pretty impossible. Verse 5 says, and he took him outside, and I like this, we need to listen to this. And he took him outside and said, now look toward the heavens and count the stars if you were able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Oh, that's a promise of God. For God, not God said, you're going to have a son. Can, and I, the, the first time, I remember the first time we went to a doctor and the doctor said, yep, you're going to have a baby. Woohoo! I had no clue what I was in for. <laughs> I'll let that sink in. <laughs> now you're the second. <laughs> But then the word, when you receive that word, can I have a child? Just something wonderful. And Abram, he heard that word from God say, you are going to receive. You're going to have a son. And Abram, just in his heart, his heart welling up. And God saying, but you think that's good? Abram, come out here with me. And those of you that, that were in our Sunday school class and saw uh, the, the, the teaching on the blood moons. By the way, Bonnie, I'm, I've got enough people coming to me. I think I'm going to need that back for Wednesday night Bible studies. Uh, even people that went through it already said, I want to see it again. So we're, we're going to be doing that on Wednesday nights of the new year. But, but uh, as we studied that, we found that God, the heavens declare his majesty. He created the stars and the planets. He, he created the solar system. He created everything to glorify him and to work together. And at this point, he used the stars. All in, I mean, you, you ever go out, that's one of the things I love about camping and now living out in the country. To go outside, turn off all the lights and look up and see how deep you can see all the stars. And the longer you look at them, you ever noticed? The longer you look, the more stars appear. And God looks at, at Abram, excuse me, he says, count the stars if you can. That's going to be what your, your family is. I'm going to pour out upon you. And the dream was confirmed. Genesis 17, verse 1. Now when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him. Can you imagine? He is, now when he was 99 years old, still no kids. How many of you at 99 would want to hear God say, Guess what? <laughs> At 52, I wouldn't be too happy. 
He's 99. I can't fathom that. He's 99 and God says to him, remember that promise I made to you? I keep my word. Wouldn't that be a wonderful and scary event right there? And God said to him, verse 4, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you will be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, father of many nations. For I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. God fulfills his promise. But how many of you know in this verse there was a requirement? If we back up, he says in verse 1, I am God Almighty. Walk before me. That in itself is huge. To walk before God and walk in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he goes on and says, and be blameless. We need to, how many of you, how many of you know it's possible to live without sin? <laughs> if he says it. Now how many of you know, knowing me it's not probable. Amen. Thank you, Bob. <laughs> You weren't trying to answer that, were you? <laughs> it is, it's not probable that I, I do some of the, don't amen me on this, I do some of the dumbest stuff. <coughs> Thank you. I do some of the, I'm going to move over to this side, it's friendlier. I do some of the dumbest stuff. I make mistakes. Sometimes I find, have you ever gotten to the end of the day and you go, oh, what did I do? God, please forgive me. Because, and the wonderful thing is we have an advocate with the Father. And he's there interceding for us. And when the devil is saying guilty, 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 Jesus is saying innocent because I paid for that guilt, Father. I'm forgiving him so you can. And God forgives us. And as, we, as we, we look at this, he says, you shall walk before me and be blameless. We have to live the best Life before God that we can, knowing that he is there every moment of every day watching us. And with those requirements, how many of you know, as we talked earlier, sometimes the dream can turn into a nightmare. If we read on to Genesis chapter 22, verse 1, we see that nightmare. Now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. You talk about your whole world coming apart. Here's the God made a promise. When I was 99, God fulfilled the promise. Now, I've come to a point in my life where the young man has grown up. I love him dearly. He's, he's just, he's it. And he's going to be a nation. And all of this is coming together. And then God says, take him and kill him. And offer him as a sacrifice for me. And see, Abraham, as Paul Harvey would say, he didn't know the rest of the story. So he went out in faith. And we know the story. He took Isaac, his son. Now, how good of a boy did this have to be? He carries the wood. They get up there and he says, Daddy, we got the wood. We got the fire to start the wood with. Where's the sacrifice? Daddy says, God will provide. They get up there. They, he helps them build the altar. They put the wood in the place. And then this, by now, he's over 110. With a teenage boy. When you're 110 and you tell a teenage boy to do something, he don't want to do it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Daddy looks at him and says, I need you to climb up and lay on that altar, son. And the boy did. Abraham looked at Isaac and he pulled out a knife. And he raised it up over his head. I can't imagine how long it took him to raise that knife back. 
And as he's getting ready to plunge that knife into his son, because God told him to and he trusted God, God told him to wait. And he provided that ram in the bush. And they were able to bring the ram out and offer that as a sacrifice. So why did God place such a heavy load on such a good man? Well, let's, let's take a look at Isaac and Jesus. Both of them were sons. First, one and only, son. Second, they were both meant for the purpose of sacrifice. And in this, both fathers had a choice not to allow this sacrifice to take place. Both of these were impossible births. Sarah was too old to give birth to a baby, and Mary was a virgin. And really, as you look at this in Genesis 22, verse 4, it said, in the third day, Isaac was delivered up to be sacrificed after God spoke it. And in the third day, Jesus rose again. And the ram was offered up in Isaac's place, Jesus was offered up in our place. And when Abraham saw that ram in the thicket, he called the place Jehovah Jireh. God will die. God wanted man to understand what God himself was willing to do for us. And we know that just a few generations after Isaac, another was going to <coughs> provide a type of Christ in Joseph as he delivered his people. As we look at this story, we, we see how the dream began. And now we see Israel coming back together again as a great nation. God has a dream. And over the next year, we're going to be regularly considering living the dream in 2015. And many of us right now find ourselves so much like Abraham, or Abram at that time, like Isaac, and like Jacob, especially like Joseph, as we wander through our wilderness and try to figure out God's plan for our lives. What is the dream? What is the dream that God has for me? Where does it begin? And how do I find that dream that God has for me? The biggest question is, what should I be doing? find the dream that God has for my life, the direction, the purpose. The answer is prayer. As I was going over this in my mind this week, the Lord kind of spoke a parable to me. He said there was a man said to his wife every morning, I'm so glad that we're married. I love you. That was a great breakfast you made. See ya. And come home at lunch. So I'm so glad you're in my life. I love you so much. That was a great lunch that you made for me. Gotta go. That evening, he would come in from work. After dinner, he would say, that was a great dinner you made. I'm so glad you're in my life. I really love you. I gotta go get some things done. <coughs> and then at night, they'd get ready for bed, and he'd tell her, wasn't that a great day? I'm so glad you're in my life. I love you so much. Good night. Those words may, they may have some real juice to them when they're first said. 
But days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, and months turn into years, and that's all she ever hears from him. What kind of a relationship are they going to have? I remember when I've mentioned before when I was in Mississippi, Kelvin Dykes. He was one of the greatest guys, big old guy, southern boy. Always had a toothpick in his mouth. And his wife, Shari, said, Calvin, how's come you never tell me you love me? Calvin looked at her and said, Shari, I told you when we got married. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. <laughs> we ought to talk a little bit, Calvin. <laughs> But communication. And my question is, is it possible that that parable demonstrates our communication with God? Does he only hear from us a couple minutes in the morning, breakfast time? Then again at lunch to thank him for the food, supper. And then when we get ready to go to bed, one of the last things, toss in a, oh yeah, thank you for the day. As, as I've been praying concerning living the dream in 2015, what does God want from Waters Edge Assembly of God? How are we going to find that pathway? The Holy Spirit has spoken to my heart more clearly. If my people which have called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. If they will seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. I believe that God is telling us this morning if we as his people will be about prayer. One of the things I've been mulling around in my brain and praying with God, I'm, I'm rereading a book called The Power of Habit. And I, I looked at God and said, God, I think we have the, I think we have the habit, habit of talking about praying instead of praying. I'm still listening, but he hasn't told me I'm wrong. I said, Father, how do we change that habit from talking about it to actually doing it? That was one of my frustrations as a kid. That scripture that, that I brought up, if my people which are called by my name, one of the ladies at the church that I grew up at would quote that time after time after time. But the only time I saw her at the altar was when other people were down there whooping it up. I didn't see her down there seeking God and the power of his spirit to see the church lifted and raised. I just saw it when everything else was going on and she jumped on as an afterthought. So it's not something new. It's something that's been going on for years, talking about prayer instead of praying, spending time with God. The dream only comes from intimate time conversation with God. And no one can do that for you. No one. We can pray for you, but no one can pray in your place. I can pray that God gives you his dream, the dream that he has for your life. I can pray, I can fast, I can seek God for you, but I can't tell you what your dream is. Only he can tell you what your dream is. The dream only comes from intimate times of conversation with God. And as we prepare to enter into the year 2015, the question is, how much time are you willing to dedicate to prayer? 
Assemblies of God has set apart the first full week in January as a, national, or as a worldwide Assembly of God day of prayer. And I can't even tell you how many millions and millions of people there are around the world in assemblies. But I want to be a part of that. And starting next Sunday, and I may, I may change my mind and put up a, a prayer clock or a prayer calendar for people to sign up. But what's important is that you sign up in your heart to the Lord. Say, Father, I'm going to start off during that week. I want to ask you, as a body of Christ, as you seek the plan that God has for your life, the dream, because if well, listen to me as your pastor, this is, this is a selfish request. Because when each one of the members of the body of Christ is living their dream, the body of Christ is living the dream. It'd be so much more fun to pastor a church where the dream is being fulfilled. But for you to, to set aside and say, God, I'm going to set aside time. And I preach sermons about, will you not tarry with me for an hour? I've, I've thrown out the challenge, but all I'm going to ask you for is more. Whatever it is you're doing, if you're giving him five minutes a day, then I'm asking you to give him ten. If you're giving him a half an hour today, then I'm asking you to give him 45 minutes. I'm asking you to give more of yourself to God. Listen to me. I can make you a guarantee. If you will give more of yourself to God, if you will spend more time in His presence, seeking His face, you're going to get blessed beyond anything that I can do for you. And over, not this coming week, but the following week, starting next Sunday, I'm going to be asking people if they will set aside time to fast. And I know. I love the thought of fasting until it starts. And maybe you're here and you say, I've got a medical condition. I can't fast food. Well, then find something that takes time away from your time with God that you can live without. That has occupied your time. Maybe it's a hobby. Maybe it's a game. Maybe it's TV. Maybe it's a computer. Whatever it is, I'm asking you to this week to figure that out. And next week, spend some time. Maybe it's just one meal fasting. Maybe it's one day. Whatever God lays on your heart, I want you to give Him more this year than you gave Him last year. I want God to receive more of what he deserves. That's us. And today, I'd like to, to seal this in prayer. And I'm not going to ask for a sign of hands. I'm not going to ask for you to come forward. I would like, though, for every one of you would, if you can, to stand with me this morning. <laughs> Father, to know what to let go of. To free me up so that I can hold tighter to you. Lord, that I can experience life. And life more abundantly. Now, 
Father, I pray that you would speak to each one of our hearts. Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Let the dream begin today. Lord, that this was more than another Sunday morning. from our bad habits and allows you to give us good habits. Now, Father, I pray and speak a blessing as each one of us that determine to live a closer life with you, a closer walk with you. As we determine that we're going to be willing to sacrifice as you speak those sacrifices to our lives. As we determine that we're going to spend more time seeking your face, that we would humble ourselves and pray to our Heavenly Father. Lord, I speak the blessing of you. the blessing of you in their lives. Father, I pray in Jesus' name and I speak this blessing as you fill us up. There will be more of you in us than there will be of us. And there will be a dynamic power that will come forth from each one of us drawing people Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that as you fill each one with so much of your presence that as we walk into an empty restaurant, we notice it's starting to fill up and people coming in not knowing why they're coming in, that we know they're being drawn by the Spirit of God. Lord, that, that we will possess so much of your Spirit that as we walk through the store, Crowds will somehow gather where we're walking because they sense the presence of God and they want more. Lord, that there would be such an outpouring of your spirit into us and filling us up that as we make our way to the house of God, people won't know why, but they'll know they need to come in with us because we've got something that they need. Father, I speak that blessing of the joy of the Lord. I speak that blessing that the zeal of the Lord will flow through each one. And we will begin to walk in the dream, in the plan that you have for our lives. Lord, when people ask us how we're doing, not only can we say we're blessed, we can tell them with full assurance I'm living the dream. Hallelujah. Father, I speak that blessing and I count it as done. In Jesus' name. And everyone that received that blessing said, Amen. Amen.